Hello. Eh, esta conversación va a desarrollarse en inglés. Gracias a todos por estar aquí. Sonamaco está muy feliz de recibir a Glenn D. Larry como parte del programa de conferencias. Él es el director del Museo de Arte Moderno de Nueva York y estará en conversación con Inés Katzenstein, también curadora de arte, arte latinoamericano del Museo del MoMA. Les cedo la palabra y bienvenidos. Welcome. Gracias, muchas gracias. Gracias a todos. Uh, we're going to speak in English. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, Glenn, hi, bienvenido. Thank you, bienvenido. <laughs> okay, so the idea of this talk is to talk a little bit about what's going on uh, at MoMA now. It's a very intense moment at the museum and a moment of changes. And I thought it was very interesting to share those situations and changes with this uh, audience here in Mexico. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of an expansion, which is the second expansion that happened in MoMA during your tenure. Can you tell us a little bit of what this expansion means to the museum? Well, the first thing you have to know is anyone who has gone through one expansion and then tries to do another is probably insane. So you'll just have to accept that as a, as a given. But it's a thrill to be here uh, among friends. It's always nice to be in this great city and to think about art. What we're doing now and is to really take the platform that we created in 2004, which was to dramatically enlarge the museum so we could show more of our collection, but also to put in a great deal of infrastructure, elevators, art corridors, things that the public never sees that would allow us to expand again. And that's what we're now realizing. So this expansion, which adds about 40,000 square feet of new space, almost all of which will be devoted for displays from our collection could take advantage of the fact that we didn't have to build bathrooms, art elevators, art corridors, all the things that consume space. This is really a project that realizes three big goals. It provides more and new space for our collection. It creates a much more welcoming and inviting entrance sequence for our public and it engages the museum much more substantially with the energy of Midtown Manhattan. We were a museum that looked to our garden uh, in the center of the museum, but didn't really engage the street around us. And one of the things that Diller, Scafidio, Renfro, our architects have done, is to open up the museum with public spaces, with windows, with uh, stairs that allow all of that energy from Midtown to become part of the museum. And of course, one of the central dimensions of our program is to show the collection in new and different ways. And at the heart of that is to take advantage of some of the extraordinary gifts that we have received over the years, like the gift from Patty Cisneros. And I see Patty here. She is more than just a trustee of the museum. She is one of the few people that I can say has fundamentally transformed what we can be because of the scale and quality of her collection. And now with the Cisneros Institute for Latin American Art, we have this platform in which to deeply engage a whole range of histories that we have paid attention to before, but we were never able to weave into the fabric of the museum. And so Inez, who is the founding director of the Cisneros Institute and an extraordinarily talented scholar and curator, has this incredible responsibility to figure out how to make all this work. So I'm interested, Inez, in your first impressions. You came from Buenos Aires. You've been to MoMA before. You even uh, spent some time working with us many years ago. But now you're in New York, and you have to think about how the presence of Latin America will be felt in the collection. So I'd love your first impressions and some of the strategies you're thinking about. Uh, thank you for, for the question. It's like a very, uh, to answer that, it's like a multi-dimensional answer that I have to bring to the discussion because I think uh, it's an extremely exciting moment uh, for Latin American art at MoMA. Uh, basically for two reasons. Uh, the arrival of the gift of Patti Cisneros 
as you said, a really transformative for the museum. They open the possibility of really telling the history of modern art in a different way, with a much more broader and uh, global perspective, bringing into the discussion uh, of modern art one of the most incredibly vibrant and uh, uh, original chapters in the history of modern art. And uh, also, the Cisneros gift includes, uh, as many of you know, uh, a contemporary donation, a, a donation of like around 90 works of contemporary Latin American art that I think that are gonna be incredibly important because I think contemporary art, I think is something that we should focus now on. Uh, I think uh, that donation will serve as the basis to continue acquiring contemporary art and to continue, bu continue building uh, a discourse about the contemporary in Latin America. So those two donations are key for building a uh, a moment of great opportunity for Latin America at MoMA. The creation of the Cisneros Institute, which is something that came with the donation, is also very important because it gives us the possibility of a sustained a research on Latin American art and to really have a platform to be actively engaged in the region. So it's a great moment, it's a moment of opportunity, also personally a moment of like a big responsibility that I'm trying to take with a joy and uh, you know like collabor collaborating with colleagues and having this uh, opportunity as something that I can share with my colleagues in the region. So that's very important for me to work not from a position of like a um, self-center, but actually like opening the discussion and sharing the resources that we have available with different uh, institutions and colleagues in the region. For me, that's very important. I come from Latin America, and I think that that is my position, my point of view, my approach to what the Cisneros Institute can do. So I, I come from work in a, in a very different context. I come to work uh, in Buenos Aires. I was directing an art school and a curatorial program. So you can imagine that the shift of, of perspective is radical. But I want to keep, in a way, the perspective from Latin America. That's very important. The discussions are other discussions. So now the conversation that I have to engage with is a conversation about Cultural, cultural translations and the politics of cultural translations. So it's a new, different conversation. But I think for me, it's very important personally to maintain my perspective from, from the South. So one of the things that we are trying to do at the museum is to think more fin synthetically about how to make the stories of modern and contemporary art more vibrant and urgent than they've ever been. And that has involved probably four or five years of thinking on the part of the chief curators and other curators at the museum. And I see Stuart Comer, who's our chief curator of media and performance in the background, and who was instrumental in creating a dialogue among all of the chief curators about the ways in which practices like performance, which have traditionally been ignored, by major institutions for a number of reasons, one of which is it's very hard to collect and even harder to preserve, but more importantly, it's even more difficult to think about how do you make that integral to the experience of a collection? How does that relate to a painting or a sculpture? And of course, there are many points of contact, and one of the achievements, I think, of this iteration of the museum is that performance and media are now woven into the, the, the pathways that you can follow as you move through the museum. And all of the traditional boundaries between disciplines, like painting or sculpture or photography or film or architecture or design uh, have also been opened up so that you get a much richer experience as you see works of art from the same moment together regardless of their media. Uh, and this, I think, 
it signals a very different kind of mu museum. A museum that's open to rethinking its own history is also a museum that's open to embracing new practices and art from other parts of the world. Not that we can ever be an encyclopedic museum, but we could be a museum in which conversations about critical issues in art can take place against the backdrop of a collection that is extraordinarily varied, far more varied than one would think. And in fact, uh, I often uh, say among my colleagues that if this project achieves one goal, and I hope it achieves more than one goal, it is that it will collapse the distance between what we have traditionally displayed and what is actually in our collection. So you would think by going through the Museum of Modern Art that we had never looked at mid-century painting from the subcontinent, from India, from Pakistan. But in fact, in the early, in late 50s and 60s, we were collecting important work from that region. We've just never figured out how to display it. And in this new parkour that we're building, we will be able to display it and display it thoughtfully. And I could talk about Africa and elsewhere in the world, Asia, Australia, uh, and Latin America, which has been part of the museum's history since 1932, that is three years after our founding, has an even greater role. And one of the first things that we will do is to present as part of our opening a major exhibition of the Cisneros collection, Sur Moderno, that you've been curating. So I wonder if you talk a little bit about that. Okay, uh, Sur Moderno is the name of the exhibition uh, of the Cisneros Modern Gift that we're going to open uh, in October with the reopening of the whole museum. And uh, it's an exhibition that shows uh, like as the, the base, the center of the exhibition are around 90 works from the Cisneros Gift. There are works from Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and Venezuela, basically from uh, geometric abstraction, concrete art, Madi art. Uh, and we're gonna show that. Uh, um, I'm working with Marita Garcia, who's a scholar from Argentina that we invited to collaborate. She's an expert in the exchanges between Brazilians and Argentine groups. So we thought that her perspective was very useful for our exhibition. And the exhibition will have the, uh, the special a feature of like putting in dialogue some of the works of these donations, some of these South American works, with some works from MoMA's holdings. So we, we had the opportunity, this extraordinary opportunity, and really is like a privilege, that we can show like, a, I don't know, a, a work by Soto with a Mondrian, for example, or we can show um, a, a, some of the Venezuelan kinetic artists with a, a artists that w showed with them in the 50s in Paris uh, in important exhibitions, or we can do these little insertions, little dialogues that are crucial to integrate the South American experiences and uh, achievements in terms of art with a broader, uh, in a broader map of the art history. So that's one thing that we're doing and we're also borrowing from different uh, collectors archival materials that are in a way supporting the exhibition in terms of bringing into the exhibition the, um, the different local context which were the discussions that these artists were engaged with through manifestos, uh, posters, uh, magazines, and photographs. So I think it's gonna be an interesting exhibition for the general public of MoMA that doesn't know this work. They work, uh, uh, the exhibition wants to have a really like strong pedagogical uh, uh, devices in order to bring like uh, these materials to new audiences and I think it's also going to be interesting for like more expert audiences because of the different you know different uh, points that we're doing in the exhibition so this is Sur Moderno is the first exhibition that I'm working on I'm very um, happy and uh, enjoying the process which is very unusual the level 
of uh, expertise of each of the different people that works at MoMA is really incredible, from conservators to photographers. Uh, we had like this, it's really a privilege. We had these amazing uh, meetings with the photographers that do the photographs of the artworks. And you can have like meetings of like three hours discussing how to make the best photograph of an artwork. And it's, they're really like in-depth in depth discussions about what the work is. So uh, I think I'm really enjoying this like incredible privilege. So we can talk forever at MoMA. That's one of our strengths and weaknesses. But um, what's interesting about the, the Cisneros Institute at least from my perspective, is that it actually grows out of a larger project that we began about 10 years ago called CMAP, or Contemporary and Modern Art Perspectives in a Global World, which asked the question, how can we as an institution engage with colleagues around the world in a thoughtful and reciprocal dialogue? where this was not simply about the Museum of Modern Art going to collect something uh, and then bring it to New York, but where it was about an exchange of knowledge and research. And Jay Levinson took on the task of being the first over director, if you want to call it that, of CMAP, and Jay is here, and that's always great to see Jay because I don't think anyone has more air miles in the world than Jay. Uh, and uh, one of the great qualities that Jay brought to this was an incredible curiosity. And so out of CMAP has come a series of initiatives in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Japan, and now uh, in the Middle East uh, and the subcontinent, where our goal is to form relationships with universities, with critics, with scholars, with artists, with collectors, to build an ongoing and sustained relationship that is not about anything other than research and the exchange of knowledge. And I think it was this notion that we were prepared to be long-term in the regions in which we felt we had the possibility to learn and engage with that perhaps encourage Patty to want to take the Latin American dimension of that program and turn it into an institute. And the, the key element of the institute is the institute is not a generator of exhibitions. It's a generator of scholarship and knowledge. And so, Inez, as you think about the kinds of programs you want to do, what are some of the first issues that you want to deal with? Well, uh, I would like to tell you a little bit how I'm thinking the general program of the institute. We are thinking of having like a, a like extended research project for around two or three years, and uh, this research project will like take a theme that is relevant for the region, and will try to do research about that theme in collaboration with institutions and colleagues throughout the region. Uh, and the idea is to be, be able to publish at the end of that period a publication bilingual that could put into the public the results of, the, of that research as well as different kind of like primary documents. A little bit uh, in the model of the primary documents that MoMA has been publishing in the last years. So the idea is that every two or three years to be able to, to have one of these publications that are the result of certain research, but also will be encouraging new research afterwards. So this idea of like en engaging in this kind of process of research is very important, is key. But in parallel, we, want, we are going to have fellowships for different, different kind of researchers. And we have a quite broad understanding of what research means in a museum. So we're going to be giving fellowships for scholars coming to New York to study our collection and to really produce new knowledge about Latin American art within MoMA's collection and in relationship to other art from the world. We're going to have a, a research fellowship for artists because we believe that artists do research in different ways than scholars, but they do research and we want to encourage that kind of research. 
uh, we're still thinking how these fellowships for artists are going to be, but I think it's very challenging and interesting and exciting. And, uh, and we're going to have a third kind of fellowships for MoMA staff. And this is very strategic because I think it's very important that Latin America doesn't become through the institute, a kind of like a ghetto of Latin Americanists. I would like to open Latin America and to help open Latin America to MoMA curators and stuff. So basically we're gonna give a fellowship for MoMA curators that wants to do new research on Latin America. And the idea of this strategic fellowship is that these curators will have the opportunity of producing in the future exhibitions or acquisitions about Latin American art. So I think it's gonna be like really productive. So we're gonna have these fellowships, we're gonna have this extended research project, and we're also gonna do public programs, events in New York, trying to deal with pressing issues, urgent issues uh, of the region. Uh, so these, in a way, are the three kind of things that we're gonna engage with. The idea is to have also a landing page in the MoMA's website with all these materials translated into Spanish and into English and be, you know, like to put it available into the public sphere, which I think is very important. So uh, the, these are in general the ideas that we're like working on. So we are gonna announce this fe these fellowships, not the fellowships, but the kind of like call for proposals very soon. So I'm very glad to, you know, be working on that. So I should say that um, one of the benefits of CMAP, this project to build knowledge, shared knowledge, has been already the exposure and opportunity for many curators at the Museum of Modern Art to do the kind of travel and research that 10 years ago was very hard to do, if not impossible. Uh, and one of the reasons that it can be done now today is we have an amazing group of people who do fundraising, and I see Todd Bishop, uh, and if he comes and talks to you, care careful, cover your wallets. Uh, he is one of the greatest fundraisers uh, in the world. But we've built travel funds, not just to have MoMA curators travel, but to also bring colleagues from around the world to the museum so that we can engage in conversations both in New York and elsewhere in the world. And one of the benefits of that is that curators, and I see Sarah Meister here, discover on their travels works of art and artists that they may never have known about or known only a little about. And one of those discoveries led Sarah to really become interested in modernist Brazilian photography, which has now led to a core collection at the museum and will lead to one of the first exhibitions, not the first, but one of the first exhibitions in the new museum about that group of photographers. And you might even think of them as vernacular photographers. They weren't necessarily professional, but had Sarah not had the opportunity to do that kind of travel, to meet some of those photographers, to see the material, we, we would have remained ignorant. And this has nothing to do with how important the material is. It was always important. It's that exchange and travel and engagement and conversation here and abroad is what builds the bridges between curators, scholars, and the public. And that's why these initiatives are so important. And I'd be remiss to say, because I forgot in the beginning, we open on October 21st of this year to the public. So I certainly hope all of you will come and be there on our opening day. And if you can't make the opening day, uh, come shortly thereafter. Um, Glenn, uh, I have a question for you regarding Latin America, because Latin America at MoMA occupies a very special place. Latin America is the only region of the world that has like a geographically defined position, curatorial position, and we are, we are going to have a new one, another one, an additional one, so that's great news. But not only that, Latin America is the only region uh, in the museum that has its own funding committee. 
there was like a committee of uh, people from Latin America that generously donate funds to acquire works from Latin America. This, this is, has been happening since 2006, and from that moment, around a thousand works have been acquired through this committee. So it's like a really active committee. And so I want to ask you about this scheme of the curatorial, uh, geographically defined curator and the funding committee, which seems like a very virtuous scheme. And to what extent, you know, then that's today is special and exclusive to Latin America. So what's the story of this, you know, and how, you know, do you think that that scheme can be exported to other regions? How do you think about that? Well, I guess I begin by thinking about it in the following way. There's only one Patti Cisneros. If there were other Patti Cisneroses in Japan or China or uh, Africa, we might have other institutions, but she is sui generis. But more importantly, from the inception of the museum, really from 1932, uh, there was an interest first in the Mexican muralists and in the avant-garde they represented here. And then beyond that, in understanding in the 30s and 40s, a whole range of politically motivated artistic practices around Latin America. So from a very early moment in the museum's history, it looked to the south. So you could almost say there is a foundational dimension of the museum that recognized the singular importance, not only of what was happening in Mexico, but what was ha happening elsewhere in Latin America. More so than it did other parts of the world, though it was, of course, interested in what was going on in India, which had its own modernist tradition, Africa, which is incredibly complicated, but where there were sort of post-liberation moments in the 60s and 70s. But even more importantly from my perspective, if you're going to think about where to have your most sustained relationship with and you are in New York, it's self-evident, at least to me, that it's going to be throughout Latin America. We live in the same world. We are tied together continentally. We are tied together intellectually. And I think it makes an enormous amount of sense that Latin America would occupy a special place within the larger frame of our interests, a space and place different perhaps than other regions in the world. Not at their exclusion, I don't want to suggest that, but I think if you were going to naturally wait where our interests would fall, it seems to me that they would naturally weight themselves, at least in the first instance, towards Latin America, and that has been true. In the 50s, we received uh, special funding from uh, the Rockefeller Foundation to acquire Latin American works of art. When I arrived at the museum uh, in 1994, it seems like ancient history, uh, one of the first conversations I had was with Patti Cisneros, who said, what are you going to do about Latin America? Uh, and uh, it was a great question because I was deeply interested, in fact, in doing something, not because it was a brilliant idea of mine, it wasn't, but I was interested in building on the rich legacy that was already at the museum and trying to find a way to translate what had been a collecting enterprise into what would become an intellectual and scholarly enterprise, one that, that took as its point of departure that we had to have a reciprocity with other institutions around uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and that it had to be based on scholarship as much as anything else. And Inez mentioned these publications that Jay Levinson has been spearheading. Uh, they're primary documents, and the effort is to work with scholars from Argentina or from Brazil uh, or Mexico to think about critical texts largely in Spanish, though not uniquely, or in Portuguese, that are otherwise inaccessible to many audiences, to translate them into English in order to have access to original documents, the foundational information you need if you're going to build an art history. And I think of those projects as important as acquiring 
a major painting. Uh, they both live on in the history of the museum and help change the kind of conversation we can have. And indeed, I think I, my first uh, role at MoMA was like 15 years ago. I was the editor of one of those pr primary documents books, was a book about the Argentine avant-garde in the 60s. And I have to say that the, the effect that that book had on the field was incredible. You know, like the the fact that we were able to translate all those documents and to put them together, to compile them together, the effect it had, in, like in universities, in scholars, in curators, and even in acquisitions from different museums, not only from MoMA, uh, is is was really unbelievable. So it's like a fantastic endeavor. I would like to ask you a last question, perhaps that has to do. You know, you've been at MoMA for almost 25 years, incredible. And uh, you've been to many different changes and mo moments of the museum and you pushed for many different challenges. How do you see from now the museum in 10 years? What are for you the big challenges, the things that MoMA has to still do in order to be what you think it should be? How many hours do we have? <laughs> um, well, the first challenge is to recognize that we're building for ourselves and our public a new platform in which to not just experience works of art, but to actually think about how works of art exist in the public sphere. And one of our commitments is that we will rotate our holdings on a very rapid basis. If you think about visiting the Louvre, for instance, pretty much the same paintings that you saw in 1980 will be there in 2000 and probably in 2200. Um, and the same is true in many other great museums. If we are successful in our ambitions, if you come to MoMA on October 21st and then you come back six months later, 30% of everything you will have seen will have rotated, will have changed. And if you come back six months after that, another 30% will have changed. And if you come back six months after that, 100% or almost 100%, not quite, uh, of what you had first seen will have changed. Obviously, there are iconic works that are central to our history. Uh, and other works that are incredibly difficult to move. So we have a Bell helicopter, because we have a design collection. Once you put that sucker up, it's not moving. Uh, and if you install a Richard Serra that weighs 300 tons, it's not gonna move every six months, it's gonna move every couple of years. And if you're lucky enough to own the Demoiselle d'Avignon or Monet's Water Lilies or Van Gogh's Starry Night, you don't want to take those off of you. You want to move them around so they're seen in a new context. But pretty much after that, uh, and then probably a handful of other works that would fall in the category of we want them on view, but we will want to see them in new context. Pretty much after that, we need to change up. We need to ventilate. We need to bring all those works of art that we have spent decades collecting that enriched the way we understand our history into the fore. So I think the first challenge we'll have, Inez, is living up to that ambition. Uh, the second challenge is to continue to expand the horizon of our knowledge that we can't stop now. We have to think harder about how we complicate and enrich the idea of modern and contemporary art. And that is really a, knowledge, a process of knowledge and scholarship, understanding the ways in which artists from other regions, take Africa, for instance, or China, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, well, there are 1.6 or 1.7 billion people in China. But what do you do with that? How do you avoid being superficial? How do you figure out a, a, a rich and deep relationship with a country that vast and where there are multiple languages that you have to master? Or Africa, where it's not just multiple languages, it's multiple countries that don't even have a shared history that you need to find a way 
to think through a sustained relationship in order to begin to understand how the story of modern and contemporary art in Africa can enrich our knowledge about the other stories of modern art that we're able to tell. So we're committed to that expansion, that intellectual expansion. Uh, and then there's a very simple task that will take up probably most of my time and I suspect pretty much all of Todd Bishop's time, he's the head of uh, external affairs and fundraising, is this is going to be an expensive operation to sustain. That we're, we're asking ourselves to work in a new and different way and we are going to need to the, ensure that we have the resources to realize that ambition. And then finally, I think of what I do mostly as trying to ensure that we have the most talented and engaged staff we can possibly have. So how do we continue to find the most talented scholars and curators around the world that can help us expand and understand the ways in which we can enrich the story of modern art. Those are, that should keep us all busy for uh, many, many years it's to come. Yeah. <laughs> we should ask if there are any questions yes, here. Yes, please, questions. Thank you very much for coming here today. I wanted to ask you how in this new project is going to highlight the art from Central America and the Caribbean specifically. Uh, because as you know, this is a region where within Latin America, there is a real institutional deficit and, uh, and amazing artistic practices that are much different from those you can find in the continent. So I was wondering how the new program is going to highlight that. Uh, one thing that is important to, to say uh, in, in relationship to your question, which is a very good question, is, uh, the, you know, this funding committee that I was referring to is called Latin American and Caribbean Fund. And it's supposed to acquire not only works from, like, the continent, but also from the Caribbean. And it's been doing it, like... And it's also been, the Caribbean has been one of the topics of CIMAP, which is this internal seminar. So previously to my arrival, there has been, I think like a, a year and a half or two years of internal seminars about the Caribbean. And that knowledge, I'm sure it's gonna be like uh, represented in exhibitions, acquisitions, and also in like bringing from the collection works that were not shown before. So uh, these two initiatives are things I think are very important and oriented towards your question. But I think, the, and one can simply say that our interest is expansive. It is not exclusionary. It is not focused on any one country, or for that matter, even on any one artistic practice. Uh, we are lucky to have real strength uh, in a number of areas, not just in geometric abstraction, but a number of areas in the museum. But our goal is to learn and to keep learning and to, in a sense, force ourselves to be part of a international conversation about contemporary, especially contemporary practices. Uh, maybe one way of further answering Inez's question to me a moment ago, the goal is to make the Museum of Modern Art feel urgent in the present. That the great works of art that we've acquired from everywhere in the world from the 20s and 30s or even the end of the 19th century are only meaningful to us in the degree to which we can make them feel urgent today. And that, that is a huge challenge intellectually. Other, other questions, yes? Thank you. What is the museum doing to develop more Patti Cisneros in Latin America? <laughs> Well, we began by taking uh, Patty to a famous hospital in New York to see if she could be cloned. Uh, and they spent a great deal of time working on that and discovered that she was unclonable, alas. 
but what I can say is that through our Latin American and Caribbean fund, which brings together uh, collectors from across the Latin American and Caribbean regions, uh, we create the opportunity, I hope, uh, for a relationship with individuals who have deep and passionate interests in their own communities to share those with us. And over time, perhaps another Patty will emerge. If she emerges or he emerges uh, in Latin America, that will be even greater than what we have. But if that individual were to emerge from another part of the world and, ha and be willing to, and I think this is the most important point, be willing to have a long-term relationship with an institution that's not initially his or her own. Patty Cisneros has been a trustee of the Museum of Modern Art for I think 30 plus years, long before she began thinking about the Cisneros Institute or making major donations. She, she had a mission, which was to hold the museum's hand to the fire that Latin American art, and by that she meant it broadly, was every bit as important and meaningful as the art of any other part of the world. And that it could be seen in conjunction with that art, not in isolation. Uh, and so that is so rare to have someone who's willing to make that kind of long-term investment of their time and then combine it with exceptional generosity. Uh, we are a privately funded institution. We do not get any city, state, or federal funding. We, we exist because our trustees and friends are willing to support us. And so you could have a great collector who shares a fabulous interest in an institution, but might not be as generous as Patty, and they could then never have that impact. So I think it's when I, I, I really do mean it. We tried to clone her. It's really hard. I haven't given up, but all you can do is try to make friends wherever you go and create a place that they can feel at home in, and perhaps someone else will also see that there's as much value in engaging with an institution outside their home as there is in engaging with an institution at their home. And I, and, I don't, I, and I want to be clear, it should never be at the exclusion of one or the other. It really sh it's really thinking about it holistically. How can you support the arts wherever you live, and then how can you share that enthusiasm you have outside of where you live? Other questions, yes? Shout or come forward. Hi, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the educational plans that you have. Um, I was just reading this morning that you're planning on having like a really active workshop series and kind of like a very active, not particularly maybe the Latin American uh -huh. collection, but the museum as uh -huh. a whole. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. So I'm happy to speak a little bit about it in general. And of course, one of the dimensions of the Cisneros Institute is to have a broad array of public programs from seminars and workshops all the way to uh, public symposia and beyond. But one of the things that we have been thinking about a lot is how do we make education writ large central to the experience of the museum? as opposed to something that happens over there. In a, and so one of the changes in the museum is that we are taking a very prominent place just adjacent to our atrium, the central point of the museum, and converting it from a bookstore into a platform for education, a place where there can be workshops, uh, lectures, conversations, art making, uh, and to make that visible. That, that When you come into the museum, one of the first things you will see is both works of art and people thinking, talking, and making art. So that the museum itself becomes something like a laboratory, a place where you can experiment as much as you can learn. And so that is an integral part of the ambitions of this 
iteration of the Museum of Modern Art. In relationship to Latin America, it's interesting because what the education department is doing are two things that I think are very important. One, I think they are starting to give a talks and tours in Spanish, which I think is a great initiative. And on the other hand, they, this uh, space that Glenn was mentioning will have like a thematic kind of a thread throughout. And in the first year of existence, the theme of this educational hub, uh, it's gonna be uh, the neighbor, the relationship to the neighbor, los vecinos, yeah? which I think is a very important theme to discuss today, uh, in relationship, especially in relationship to, to Latin America. And so I think those are two things that are like, a, details, but I think that speak of a certain interest of the education departments of really engaging with issues that are at stake in the present. We'll take another question if there is one. <laughs> 